at the end of the meditation and communion prayer, if you wear the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus' hand is reaching out to you to share these emblems, if you will. Each of us come this morning and is making a decision to worship and to have fellowship with the living God as well as with one another. And that is done because of the blessing of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The decision of this wisdom is found in Matthew 13, 44 and 45. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Nothing can have a value that is equal to the gift of accepting Jesus Christ. But there's an other side of this coin, of this thought. And that other side is Jesus possessed everything in the presence of the living God. Every field, every pearl, he possessed the universe. Yet, Jesus was willing to leave the serenity of heaven to become a willing sacrifice for all of man's sin. He gave up everything for this communion, for us to become his bride. The price that was paid on that cross can only be fully be known by the cross. Then reading from the scripture, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eleo, Eleo, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus at that hour, he didn't have the presence of God and his love. Now God's presence being withdrawn, he had that sorrow of that moment. And he went on with that sacrifice. And, but Jesus could not perceive the horror of sin and life without the living God when it's separated from him. The world will have God's order and his love and his love withdrawn and God's justice and judgment will come to the world and it will reign over it. To the believer living in the faith of what is shared at this communion ta table, they will never know that hour. For God withdraws from the world. God never withdraws from the believer, the believer that is placed in Jesus Christ and the gift that was given us to on the cross. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are what we live and that life is a trusting in the cross. Jesus' love, Jesus' worthy, perfect life that came from eternity, from eternity to teach and to share us what life will really be in eternity. For these emblems, they are to remember our Lord and Savior. And we accept those. We want to make it known before mankind. This is our belief but we also make it known before you, the living God, that we confess our sin and need Jesus. And at this table, we accept and praise him. In Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to partake in your body and blood. Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you for uh, allowing us to be with you and forgive our sins. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us uh, for the rest of the week and bless your name. And we thank you for everything you do. In your, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Lori's doing our special. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure it will be amazing like always. <laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. Um, this morning I was thinking about what I was gonna say before I sang, and by the time I got up here and practiced, while I was practicing, I realized I wasn't gonna say any of that. Um, it's funny how that happens. Uh, then I got into the Bible study back there, and I saw more of that. <coughs> Whenever we, uh, first of all, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever gone through your whole life and been able to have everything go just perfect the way you planned it? I mean, every single thing. Really? That's awesome. That's great. 
<laughs> we got one person. Um, the thing of it is, God has his plan in our, in our lives, always. And even though we don't get what we think we need or want, it doesn't mean that it's not his plan. And like Michael said this morning, he said, in the bad times, we need to lean into God. And those bad times are the times that we grow. We become more. And I think each of us have had those times where we've experienced that. So the name of this song is called Trust in You. And the verse that I really like about it, and, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but all songs, worship songs, are usually based on a Bible verse. Sometimes they're very obvious, sometimes they aren't. But um, this one, there are several verses that could have gone with it, but this one is Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. So trust in him.
Well, good morning. Glad to see everybody here. It's a beautiful day outside, and uh, yes, I, I don't get to play golf right now, and I'm pretty upset about that, so thanks for rubbing it in, Earl. Um, I'm glad to see everybody here. Uh, one of the things that I hope that you all understand, and if you don't, it would become an understanding for you, is that we as a, as a church here at Canton Christian Church, right, we believe that it is all about Jesus all of the time. Right? Our goal here as the church, not a church, but as the church, is to foster loving relationships that help to guide each other uh, on our path to a deeper and better understanding of who Jesus is and who he says we are. Uh, so we are in week two of our misquoted series. And last week we looked um, at, at the falsehood of the American covenant. And, and this week we're going to look at our self-imposed wrong identity. Now, everybody in this room has a self-imposed wrong identity, whether you're aware of it or not. And hopefully by the end of this, we're all going to be aware of whatever it is that we have applied to ourselves. And I'm going to unpack that quite a bit more as we go along. And, uh, but I, I want to say that, yeah, I, don't, I hope you don't walk away um, from each one of these sermons in this series because they're all kind of uh, in your face, step on your toes. Um, they're geared that way. It's meant to be that way. And, but I'm not calling anybody out specifically as a terrible Christian or anything like that. That is not my intention at all. The intention is to get us to see the reality of where we are as believers individually. Uh, so the big idea um, throughout this series deals with the fact that it's all too easy uh, to allow our cultural context to blind us. Uh, to the magnificent, if sometimes hard to swallow, truths of Scripture. <clears throat> and the song that Lori just sang, if you're paying attention to the words, uh, there at the end of the chorus, I think it's chorus, I don't know what it's called. Anyways, um, uh, the mountains I wanted you to move, the sea I wanted to walk through, but then you would make the path. So there's a difference there. The things that you want or think you need, and God doesn't respond in the way you think he should is because he knows better than you. And he's providing for you a greater experience in reality than anything you can imagine, even if you can't see it in the middle of whatever it is that you're in. And so that's what our cultural context does to us when we look at scripture. It blinds us sometimes. And we're going to tackle each one of these messages uh, straightforward, completely honest, uh, but full of love, all while keeping our eyes firmly fixed on the cross and on Jesus. Uh, so our main text this morning is going to be Romans chapter 8. Uh, we're going to look at verses 28 through 30. But before we get there, let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray that as we dig into your word today, God, that you would make every ear made ready to hear, every mind made ready to understand, and every heart made ready to accept your message for each one of us here today and those who are joining us online. God, we pray that your spirit would move openly and freely. We pray this in Christ's most powerful and precious name. Amen. So our culture today tells us to be true to ourselves. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that in God's kingdom. Uh, the gospel clearly calls us to be conformed not to ourselves, but to the image of Jesus. So Shakespeare uh, might have said it a little more eloquently when he said, to thine own self be true. But the same sentiment has seeped uh, inside the cultural oxygen of our age. Be true to yourself. Uh, the great Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor has described our age as the age of authenticity. Now, rather than uh, trying to earn our identity and be accepted by the world around us, which is a crushing burden to try and bear. We should receive the identity that has been given to us through the gospel, through what Jesus has done. Your identity is a son or a daughter of the King of Kings, the great I am. That is who you are. You are a prince or a princess in the kingdom of God. Now, the idea of authenticity uh, in this age of authenticity is that each person has their own unique way of being themselves. Uh, being authentic to yourself means that you give 
uh, expression to whatever is inside of you. Now, we as Christians understand that the things that are inside of us aren't necessarily good things. And to give them expression, to give them voice, may end poorly. Now, I don't know about you, but there are some things that lurk deep within me that I'm not real sure I want to share with anyone I come into contact with. I'm not going to blast them out on a video uh, on the screen for everyone to see. Uh, Dr. Andrew Root, he's a professor of practical ministries at Luther Seminary, said this, In many ways, the age of authenticity is good. It asserts that our concrete and lived experiences are important, even central. Now, I agree with Dr. Root if, big capital, bold, underline, if, our experiences are viewed through the lenses of the gospel. Uh, the problem that arises from this way of living, uh, that this asserts this concrete experience that everything I've done is important and it matters, all my experiences, the problem with this way of living is it comes into sharp contrast with the Bible. With the age of authenticity, the only standard by which someone can be judged is themselves. I'm going to say that again. Pay attention. Listen carefully. With the age of authenticity, though it may sound nice, the only standard by which someone can be judged is themselves. Now, you know this is happening when you hear statements like, no one should tell anyone else how they should live. Or my favorite, what's right for you is right for you. What's right for me is right for me. Now, this can cause some major problems on the level of morality. With this way of thinking, how can we clearly call evil things evil? If the only standard by which to judge evil is by what I think is evil, not what you think is evil, how do we judge morality? What does that look like? A very extreme example, the Holocaust. Right? We would all deem that to be the absolute evil of man, would we not? But by whose standards? So weren't uh, Hitler and the Nazis just being true to themselves? <coughs> They were following what they believed to be right. And, and who are we to say that that was wrong? Again, that's an extreme example of, of what I'm talking about. I, I, but I think the contrast it helps explain the dangers of the age of authenticity. What's more, being true only to yourself and not letting others define you is impossible. We all have a, a lot of strong inward desires, but we don't let all of them define us. What we do is look at the world around us and allow it to dictate which of our inward desires are appropriate. Uh, Pastor Tim Keller gives this profound uh, illustration in his book, Making Sense of God. Uh, he says, let's conduct a thought experiment. I don't have it in the back because it's, it's long and it would just be arduous. So just listen. Let's conduct a thought experiment. So I want you guys to join in uh, with Pastor Keller here. Imagine an Anglo-Saxon warrior in Britain in 800 AD. He looks into his heart and sees two strong inner impulses and feelings. One is aggression. When people show him any disrespect, his natural response is to respond violently. Living in a shame and honor culture with a warrior ethic, he will identify with this feeling. He will say, that's me. But let's say that the other impulse he sees in his heart is a, a same-sex attraction. He wishes that we're not there. He will look at the feeling and say, that's not me. Not come forward to today. Imagine a young man walking around Manhattan. He has the same two inward impulses. What will he say to himself? He will look at the aggression and say, this is not who I am. He will look at the, his sexual desire, however, and conclude that is who I am. Now, I told you earlier, our main text is Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. So if you haven't already, go ahead and flip open there, and uh, let's see what Paul has to say about our identity. This is what he says in, in verse 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. That's key. According to whose purpose? The person's purpose or God's purpose? God's purpose. Let's hold on to that. 
His purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance. And he chose them to become like his son. So that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. So in verse 3, uh, Paul gives a much different view of the Christian's conception of identity. It's not about being true to who you already are on the inside, but rather it's about being conformed into the image of Jesus. See, we become who we uh, were truly meant to be, not by becoming more like who we are in our own minds and our own sinful hearts, but by becoming more like Jesus. Uh, Pastor Rick Warren said, it's only in God that we discover our origin, our identity, our meaning, our purpose, our significance, our destiny. Every other path leads to a dead end. Another problem with the idea of being true to yourself is that it's very heavy burden to carry. If you aren't successful, then the only person you have to blame is who? You. Our culture despises losers. Being true to yourself means you, uh, you have to earn your identity, but the gospel suggests a different sort of identity, a given identity, not one that's earned, not one that you long, work hard, struggle to find. It's a given identity. Now, this God-given identity is different than the identities that our culture has uh, given you. Every person in this room, those who are watching online, uh, has been given an identity by the world. That identity has shaped the way that you view yourself, the way you view others. That identity has come from all directions, family, friends, workplaces, school, church, list can go on and on and on. This morning, I want you to know that that identity that has been given uh, by your parents or your siblings, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, or, or whoever else, does not define who you are. That does not define who you are. That is not your identity. If you belong to God, your identity is given by Him. God identifies you as a son or a daughter. Right, we like to talk a lot about in the church about being adopted into the family of God. That's a beautiful sentiment. We all understand the heart behind adoption and what that looks like. But when you look at the original language, it goes a little bit deeper than, than just adoption. It's the idea that you have been grafted into the family. So if you don't know what a graft is, just imagine they take a piece of skin from your calf and they put it on your arm. And over time, it just becomes part of your arm. There's no difference. that You can't tell it apart. It's just always been part of it. We've been grafted because of what Jesus has done into the family of God. So it's not just that we've been given the, the title of son and daughter. We are, like we are born into it. It is natural. It is given. It is who we are. It's an identity that is not bestowed on you because of anything that you've done but because of what Jesus has done for you. So I want to look at verse 30 again there in Romans chapter 8. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given right standing, he gave them his glory. I want you to think about your, your old identity like carrying around a backpack with all of your school books inside it day after day. Uh, eventually that weight becomes overwhelming. Your back begins to hurt, your shoulders hurt, you grow weary, you grow tired. Uh, now that identity uh, given to us through the gospel is if someone comes up behind you and lifts the backpack from your shoulders. It begins to carry that weight. Now when you begin to see yourself through the lens of the gospel, you begin to see yourself how God sees you. It's when we begin to live in this new identity that we can truly begin to live in the freedom found in the cross. The crazy thing is, when you live in the freedom found in Jesus, you become a world changer. 
Does that mean you're going to go and change the entire world? Probably not. But what if you change the world of one person in your inner circle? What if your life shifts direction so much that maybe your spouse or a sibling or a good friend begins to ask questions and wonders why, how, what's this look like? You're so different now. Where, who is this new person? Then you get to have that wonderful conversation that starts with, well, let me tell you about Jesus. Bill Hybels said, nothing on earth has greater potential to change lives and carry out his kingdom work in your community than your local church. There's nothing like the local church when it's working right. Its beauty is indescribable. Its power is breathtaking. Its potential is unlimited. No other organization, organization on earth is like the church. Nothing even comes close. So I'm going to begin to wrap up this morning's message with four verses uh, that speak directly to a believer's identity. They are not the only four verses. They are just four of my favorite verses that hold a lot of significance and meaning behind our identity. And the first one is John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And my favorite is actually found all the way back in Genesis, chapter 1, verse 27. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Now, I don't know what it is that you have gone through in your life. I can only imagine the toll that the things have taken on the way that you see yourself, the way that you have identified yourself based on what others have said in your experiences. But I want you to hear me loud and clear. You are loved beyond measure, and God is always there with you and for you. You are a son or you are a daughter of the King of Kings. The Alpha and the Omega. The I am, I am. That is who you are. Allow that identity to begin to change not only your world, but the world around you. In a moment, we're going to close with song. And as I say, every single Sunday, worship God for who he is. Don't care what other people around you think. Sing your heart out for God. All the things that he's done for you, all the things he's doing for you right now, and all the things he's going to do for you. And then, of course, we will have some announcements and we'll exit on song. But before we get there, join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, God, we thank you. And we thank you for all the things uh, that you have done for us, God, all the things that you are doing for us right now, and all the things that you're going to do for us in the future. We got in that I thank you for the identity that you have given us. Yeah, that no matter what has happened to us, no matter what has been said to us, God, even no matter the way we talk to ourselves, God, we can find hope and freedom in who you say we are. And God, I pray for every person in this room and those who are watching online that they begin to live in that freedom boldly with humility. God, that they would love recklessly. That everything we do would point others to you. God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.